Welcome to the Find My Catalyst podcast. We all have problems we're looking to solve, and we know that there are solutions out there, but we struggle with this. How do we find the solution? Where does that nudge come from to help us take the next step and start solving tough problems? This podcast is designed to help you find your catalyst and take that next step. I'm Mike Simmons. I'm the founder of Catalyst Sale. This episode is brought to you by the Catalyst Sale Game Plan. It's our approach to goal setting and execution. If you head to catalystsale.com forward slash game, you can find more information. My catalyst today is Casey Graham. Casey is the founder and CEO of Gravy. He's also the author of the No BS Small Business book, How to Win When Most Fail. Casey, it is awesome to have a conversation with you. And I am really excited that we had a chance to meet in Phoenix a while back because after listening to the audiobook and hearing somebody read the book and then meeting you in person, I realized you do not sound like the person who read the audiobook. That's right. I would never sit down and read the book. It's been my number one complaint and feedback is that I wish you would have read the book, but I don't know if anybody wants to hear the Southern accent for a couple of hours. I, I think it's great. <laughs> so the, uh, so it, the book is absolutely amazing. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get into that. We'll get into that a bit. I, I'd like to just start right out of the gate with why is it important for you that people are the best version of themselves? I think it's not about being the best version of yourself for yourself. And I think that the people that I define success as the people that know you most, that they love you the best, meaning that you show up in those relationships because I believe life is about relationships. I even say that in the book is that I believe everything is an excuse for relationships. And so being the best version of yourself is not the, not where I would stop with that. I would say it's because of how we affect, influence, and ultimately, you know, influence the life of other people around us. And where do people fail with this? Like, what, what's the where do where do people struggle with this this kind of question? The view of influence others. That like, where do we fail? I think it's we don't think about it okay. enough, and it's. The best version of yourself, that sounds great. And I could get up and do a big speech about it and get everybody excited about it. Right. But on Tuesday morning, when you have to drive your kids to school and then you've got work and you have pressures and you may have a a partner or be married or you have all these different things, is that the life urgency of responsibility squeezes out a lot of the thinking around becoming better. And so I think when we're younger, you know, when you're a kid, you think more about what your future could be and how you could become this thing and all this kind of stuff. And I believe as we get older, our dreams get less. As we increase in age, our dreams go down oftentimes. And I think life in and of itself does that to us if we let that do it to us. And so that's what I would say is a big detriment to not thinking about what our legacy, what our life and why we even exist is. Yeah. You talk about it in the book about a visionary arsonist. And That's me. <laughs> so what's a visionary arsonist? A visionary arsonist. So visionaries can see A, the beginning, and they can see Z, the end. And they can see it vividly and clearly. So visionaries can see what we need to do to start and what it looks like when it's done. But we forget that there's B, C, D, E, F, G, and there's a lot more letters in between what our skill set and gifting is. And so we unintentionally are wired to avoid pain. And so letters B, C, D, E, F, that's painful for visionaries because it takes time, because we're not good at it, because we think it should just be done and done fast and get over with because we can see it. And, and, and the lady I've worked with for 20 years is my co-founder. She always says, Casey, just because you can see it done in your head does not mean that it's done. And so a visionary arsonist, what makes it the arsonist is we get impatient with the process. And when we get to letter G or H, we see another A and a Z and we will self-destruct the progress made when the pain goes up high. And instead of adjusting to understanding that this part of the process, we then come back to what we're good at, which is the A to Z. And so I, my, in my career, you know, I've been entrepreneur for about 15 years. And earlier in my career, probably the first five years, 
I could get just about, and I'm not saying this to be arrogant or boastful, I'm truly not, but I could get just about any idea to about $500,000 in revenue pretty fast. Okay. Figure it out, sell, go, get it, work, make it, will it to be. But then once you get to 500 and then you have some team and then you have people around you and all this kind of stuff, what would happen is I would say it's not working, but really, and so what I would do is then go back to a new idea that I could get to $500,000 and then I would get to that one and go. And so that's what a visionary arsonist is, is that they start fires and they don't have enough right people to manage those different fires. And so ultimately they either burn out or catch the woods on fire or anything in between. And so I think visionary arsonist is it's a lack of patience ultimately with the process. I like how you highlight the story. I believe this was the story in the book. There was a, a CEO or founder that you were that you were coaching, and you, and I think that his feedback was or her feedback. I forget what, but it was that every time we meet, you just tell me something different, and you just keep agreeing with me. It was yeah. something, it was something different, and this get, then kind of ties back into the the importance of owner's intent being yeah. very deliberate, very clear, very intentional around owner's intent. Can you talk a bit about what owner's intent is? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a one sentence statement that informs all of your decisions. So it it is the king or macro filter through which all of your decisions are made. And it's also how to get ruthlessly honest about yourself, your business, your career. And here's the key. And what you really want from both. And I've asked over a thousand people this one question, and most people struggle deeply with it. I just literally was sitting down and say, what do you want? And I shut up. And usually what comes out is a list of everything that they don't want. It's or it's things that it's the negative side of life and like all of the things that they're trying to avoid and all of those different things. Very rarely have I asked that question and somebody with a single distinct sentence can tell me, this is what I want for my career and my life and compact it into one, maybe two sentences and be clear about it. And that goes back to your original questions because we don't take time to think about what we truly want. And we settle for surface answers of what we think we should want, maybe how we were brought up. Maybe what culture says. I mean, the startup culture, you know, every entrepreneur I meet with is, see, I got to get to the series B and then we're going to do this, then we're going to exit and all this kind of stuff. And I ask them, how many founders that have gone through that process have you talked to that got to the end of it and it didn't work out? And the answer is always zero. And so we get baited in by culture to thinking that we should want certain things or, or by LinkedIn or what somebody else is doing or, or whatever. I talked to another person that said, I got to start a course. I got to start a course. Why? Well, Justin Welsh on LinkedIn started a course and, you know, he said, you know, you, you do this and then you build a life and you start a course. And I said, I was like, so what do you want out of your career? And then it was all about meeting with people individually. And it was a kind of, a, it was a lady, she's got like a coach mentality. And I was like, this is the complete opposite of everything you just said. This is scale. I don't talk to anybody. I sell this widget that spins. Like I thought I should do that because he's doing that, but she hasn't really stopped to ask the question, what do I want for my life and my career? Because oftentimes we are putting our true fulfillment and purpose and all of that at risk and jeopardy when we haven't taken the time to truly decide what we want and be okay with that being our own. And that's the big part of this is it's oftentimes somebody else's. It's oftentimes our families. It's oftentimes I got this degree, so now I must do this. It's oftentimes people around us, culture. It's oftentimes inside of our business. Well, I'm at this level, and so I need to become the director. Well, why? Do you know what the director does? Like, do you know all the other things that happen in their life that they have to put up with and the conversations they have to, do you really want this? And people oftentimes just don't take the time to develop. And when I say owner's intent for people in your career, this would be your career intent. What do you want for your career? And everybody says advancement to what, and to what cost are you willing to give it up? I really like how you highlight that in the book and kind of distinguish between the, you know, what happens as an individual contributor inside an organization. And you know, at Intel, one of the things that 
that is, was big there is you own your own employability. Uh, when I first moved into an account executive role, my you know, mentor at the time, this was in an ed tech company that said, you know, you need to operate your business as a franchise. This is your business. And that, and I didn't, you know, nod my head and I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I didn't know what that really meant. And yeah. being able to bring this back to this simple question, which is what do you want? What do yeah. you want? And seeing your, seeing yourself, this is where people struggle. So when we talk about building a personal brand, so that's a buzzword. Yep. Personal brands have been around since humans have been around. Like everybody has a personal brand, regardless if they've defined it or not. And so your career, what I see people struggle with is I don't think some people say everybody should be an entrepreneur. Everybody should. I don't believe that. And I believe there's most people that will never do that. And they're going to work inside a company and be an individual contributor or grow up to the ranks, manage people or whatever. But you should still view you. As I literally have a document and it's, I'm I'm doing a circle with my hands because it's this bubble chart I have and it says Casey Graham Inc. And so I believe everybody should view their selves as an ink, as an incorporated. And even if they're working for somebody else. And then inside of this, decide I own my career. I own where I decide to work and what I decide to trade off for what I do and I don't do. And to take the owner mindset and then to think that through and go, okay, so what's my purpose? What's my mission? What's my traits and characteristics I want to be known by? What's my skill sets? What's my thing? And build that out. And most people never do that. And they wonder why they're unfulfilled, why they go from job to job every 12 to 18 months, just when they get a pay bump and then they go to the next one. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's because we don't take ourselves. I don't believe we should take ourselves too serious. But I think we should take ourselves serious enough to see that we are an enterprise in and of ourselves, And that brand is valuable. It's worth something. And what I've seen, the people that take time to build this for their career, they end up being more fulfilled and making more money because it's clear and their pathway is clear. And the other thing about owner's intent that's powerful for people in careers is it helps your employer help you get it, whatever it is. If you're clear about don't just waiting around and hoping that maybe they'll notice me and I get the thing and all this kind of stuff to say, this is my intent. I want to be the VP of sales. I know it may take five years. This is what I want to do. And it may not be here, but somehow else, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm open to every learning and skill set and coaching that would come from that. Any meetings I can sit at, anything I can do, because that's where I'm going. And I'm thinking at that level, well, that is a great job of stewarding your brand and taking value in it and knowing what you want. And then if you go back to, what you were just describing is the whole, hey, I can see A to Z. And then I get myself from A to G and then turn around and reset. And now I'm yeah. doing another A to Z. And then I go A to G and then reset and do another you know, yeah. A to Z. You find yourself just kind of moving around really, really fast, but getting nowhere. You That's might get right. lucky, but you're, gonna, you're not going to accelerate speed to impact. That's right. So you get older, but you don't get better. Yeah. You get older, but you don't get better. And I think, Mike, this is an important piece because I don't believe that you will ever accelerate past G until you go through the character transformation of understanding why you keep starting over and shifting and moving. And so not just for leaders or entrepreneurs, but anybody, you will never get offered a new test in life until you pass the the one that's been given to you. And that's why you see angry granddads. That's why you see unfulfilled people on their deathbed is that they never passed that test of fulfillment, never passed the patience test, never passed the love test, the trust test, all of those different things. They're all tests. And we think of it as career, but I look at it as character development. And that's the point of why we do all this stuff. And that's the benefit of your career is that it offers you the opportunity to advance in your character development. So can you talk a bit about how you help others, help people inside your organization and enable others? And I've seen a number of stories that you shared on LinkedIn related to this, but can you share some examples of how you've helped others do this, how you create the space for people to not get into this vicious cycle of you're resetting before they actually solve for the gate they've, they've, right. they've got to get through. Two specific examples. One is in our 
our team onboarding is that we do something called Kool-Aid. It's where you drink the gravy Kool-Aid. <laughs> and some people have said, you shouldn't name it that or whatever, but I said, whatever. So inside of Kool-Aid, we take time and, and our people and HR team walk through me breaking down these practices and principles. And we create something called why I gravy. So why I gravy. And this is our attempt. Now we don't make everybody do, you don't have to publish it. Like there's some people that they don't take it serious and that that's fine too. But for the people that do, and they do care and they want to, they take it really serious and they really do it. And the power in this is you cut past the BS and I'm just so excited to be here. I love the opportunity. Culture so cool. You know, blah, blah, all this kind of stuff. And you get down to why in the world would you spend more time with the people inside of gravy than you're going to spend with your actual family or your friends or any other relationships? Why are you trading that time truly? Well, it's a great opportunity for what? Well, you know, and then we'll dig down and without sparing the details of how we dig down into all of it, we get down to like people share answers that they're embarrassed by. So there was one lady and she, we did the whole thing. And then she finally came back and she was a processor. She said, you know why I do this? I am a military spouse and my husband moves every two years. And I've never been at a place to where I don't have to start my career over every two years. And so just because you're virtual and I can stay in the same company for the next couple of years, even if I don't advance, even if I don't make any more pay, I don't want to, that's not any of my motivating factor. The reason I gravy is that I can work from wherever I want to work. Well, that's a great answer. Another guy came in and he was embarrassed because he said, after we went through the whole process, he came and he said, if I'm being completely honest, which is when you get the real answer. I want to be a VP of sales within two years and gravy is a stepping stone for me to get there. Some people would never say that to the CEO of a company. Sure. But in our culture, it allowed me to go, well, how can we be the best stepping stone for you to get there? Regardless if it's here or somewhere else, we got you for two years. Like, what can we do in the process to equip you for that and help you with that and make? And so, because he was honest, then he got opportunities that he otherwise wouldn't have had if he said, I'm just here because I like selling and I, I love being a sales guy and making money. And so, that's the power of helping people develop their intent. Why do leaders struggle with being able to create an environment where folks feel comfortable being honest and transparent and open about these things? Because, as you said, just knowing that's what they want to do, then you can start to think about, hey, there's different ways that we can help, different things that we can provide exposure to that will allow this person to see what it feels like to be on that side. And then they can evaluate, is that really what they want to do? Yeah. And, and be prepared for doing it when they move in to those kind of things. So why, you say we as leaders, why do we as leaders screw this stuff up? I think it's because we believe that we control more than we think we can control. <laughs> what do you mean? We're not in control? I don't, I, I don't understand. We, we can't control everything. This isn't Geppetto with puppets and you know, everything's just going to work out perfect and people are going to follow the process and all the data is going to go where it wants yeah. and everything's going to happen at the right time. And I'm not going to miss a light and all of that other kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. I'm just telling you, I think it's a, it comes down to the age old thing of control. And the way you can know if a leader struggles a lot with this is the pronouns that they use when they speak and they write. And what I mean by that, if they say like, if it's like my staff, my team, my VP of sales, there's this thing that I feel like unintentionally, and I don't think everybody that says that is a bad person or whatever, but there's this unintentional thing that I've got them in their mind. And I just don't believe that. I don't believe I have anybody in anybody's mind. I believe that everybody is in charge of their own destiny. And that we work together in unison to be able to accomplish that together. That's why we build intents and share them both ways so that we're just honest on the process. And I think a lot of uh, leaders especially struggle with like, I know leaders that don't let their team like have a side income. And so what happens in that culture is people still have side incomes, but nobody talks about it, but everybody knows that everybody has one. And so ultimately happens is control mutes a conversation 
that's still going on and happening anyway, but everybody's just unintentionally lying to each other about it. And so that's when uh, cultures become toxic is that we're hiding this thing or we got this little thing over here. And so I think that's a big issue is just to control. How'd you become a big Georgia football fan? Alabama. That's my oh. worst nightmare. I, I'm just messing Don't. with you. I will come through this screen. I just wanted to see what kind of reaction I was going to get. Well, yeah, I'm going to control the reaction and it's going to be vicious. <laughs> absolutely awesome. So let's talk a bit about just kind of building and kind of yeah. you know, thinking about different revenue streams because you've been really public about this and the way that you share. I mean, you've got what you're doing with Gravy. You talk about how LinkedIn has made an impact on revenue that's coming into the business and rev- coming into the into Casey Inc. that mm-hmm. creates other opportunity for you to do a lot of other stuff, including coaching. So how do you think about separate revenue streams when it comes to understanding your owner's intent and the impact it has on owner's intent? And I think really what I'm Looking at is you know, other than the alignment around Georgia football, which I'm not. A, I'm a Sun Devil, so and I was just having a little bit of fun there. But how can people think about alignment as it relates to owners' intent, both as an owner running a business and as individuals who are operating inside their intent? That's right. Well, for me, most CEOs are just CEOs. Yeah. Like most of the time. They may have like investment property or so, you know, like this, but but they don't have an active side income. Is that what you're asking about specifically for well, me? What I'm thinking about is you've got a number of different revenue streams that all align with things that are important to you. And they yes. impact not only your customers, well, they impact your gravy customers. They also impact individuals out there who ultimately become your customers based on some on yeah. some type of relationship that you have. But what I'm wondering about is how do people start to think about different revenue streams that I should be looking at so that I'm aligned and continuing to get value out of the work that I'm doing? That's kind of where... And maybe it's just a crap question. Maybe I should go back to the whole Georgia, Alabama thing. That was a better question. No, I'm just a... So the way I came to my philosophy on revenue streams is I need what uh, my coach calls a visionary sandbox to play in. Okay. Because I'm a visionary arsonist, if I spend 100% of my time looking at our current business, there's going to be all these operational issues that pop up every day. And every operational issue does not demand a visionary reaction. And so for me to properly operate at Gravy, I have to have an outlet where I can operate and I can do things and test things and screw things up, but there's no downstream effects to anybody else except for me. And so I didn't know this early on. And that's why I kept creating chaos inside the organization is because what you founders are good at reacting, what's what is survival uh, CEOs are good at acting on a plan. And so I have to force myself to have that CEO world but then have my reactionary world somewhere else so that I can react because inside of your company, if you react, what CEOs know is for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction that happens. And if you're reacting all the time, you're creating chaos and you can't scale chaos. And so my nickname to my friends is Chaos Casey. And so I go into this other world to create chaos. And out of that chaos, I get my fix of being able to do it. But then also I connect it to helping people. I love helping people with their owners and 10. I love helping people with their LinkedIn brand. I love, I like, I genuinely enjoy doing it, but not all the time. So about 20% of my year, I'll go into that world. I dip my toe in and then I make money off of it. So my goal this year is to make 400 grand on the side. And that 400 grand on the side takes the pressure off gravy to deliver the income that if I took that out of gravy, it would it would crush the growth because I'd rather put that in the growth of, of that company. And so for me, it's a strategic decision to be healthy at gravy and then to have fun on the side. And so that's why I do it. And then all of that extra money that comes in allows me to do what I love the most, which is traveling with my family. And so I'm not luxurious in any area of my life except for travel. And so when we go, we go big and we do fun things and we go around the world and we do it up big and do it up right. So I can accomplish those two things together. And that's what allows me 
to be able to do both. And that's why I do it. It's pretty cool to hear you talk about the alignment there and being able to scratch an itch that you know that's out there, that if you don't allow it to be scratched, you don't do it, you're going to get into a situation where you're just going to create pressure inferno and pressure (laughs) behind It's a pressure cooker. Yeah. It's a pressure cooker. You know, you let the owner is just different. Meaning, I'm sorry, the founder is just has a different view of the organization and you can't change it. Like they're just gonna, it just means more to the person who birthed the baby than the person who babysits the baby. And so like, you're just going to be hyper crazy about it, but that doesn't work past, you know, a certain point in revenue and employee count and all that kind of stuff. And so I learned that and I'm still learning that the hard way. Sure. What's that point? When you say certain point, like, is there, how would you look at it? I mean, do you look at it as like a Dunbar's number of 150 people inside the organization and then things start to change? Is it, is it a revenue number? Is it a injection of cash as you make it through individual rounds? Like what's the, what have you seen or what would you share as someone starting to think? Yeah. Hey, you know what? I started as a founder. I built this thing. I really enjoyed getting into the grind and now I'm something's changed. So I need to either find someone to replace me. I need to fire myself so that I can do other things inside organizations or this organization. What's the, what are the, some of the signals that people would see where they start to feel that breaking point? Yeah. For me. And again, this is just my journey and I'm not saying it applies across the board as a founder from zero to 1 million in, in ARR, you are the chief sales guy or gal period. I've not seen one that works. There's only like one app called Facebook that some tech guy founded and it just spread and worked. Like very rarely does that work, right? So I'm the sales guy from zero to 1 million. From one to 3 million, build the initial team, obviously build some team, but you start bringing in some of the key department leaders, but you're still got to be the driving force into those departments. And the point of one to 3 million is then delegating, getting a separation on some of those departments. From three to 10 million is when it gets tricky because from three to 10, oftentimes the company is moving into trying to find product market fit for scale. And until you find product market fit to scale, you've got to stay heavily invested and involved to know who are these right kind of customers. Like we've got enough data now to know that this is, this isn't just what I think. This is what it says. And Here's the close rates and we know the percentage and we can find and target the right account, like getting it to where there's machine like things starting to happen, but the machine's not fully built yet. You've got to be involved to that point heavily. Then there comes a point when you find product market fit. And at that point, there is a next level of recruiting that comes in. If you get people to come in that don't just lead necessarily the doing of the departments, but the strategic leading of the departments at that point. The leader has to, the CEO has to graduate to CEO. And this is when most companies get absolutely wrecked is in that process and transition is because we still remain as that founder entrepreneur activity, but you've brought people in that you want to delegate to and you delegate tasks instead of responsibility. And so delegating tasks gets you to product market fit, but past that point, delegating responsibility is what has to happen. And then your calendar is free. And when, when an entrepreneur's calendar is free, they'll either they wreak havoc inside of their business or you've got to have something external to be able to do. So that's the key. That's kind of the progression that I see. Absolutely awesome. Casey, as we go back to owner's intent, can you just you work through what are the rules if, yeah. when building owner's intent? Yeah. And these are guiding principles, you know, but I've rarely seen people get to a good owner's intent without going through them. Yeah. <laughs> so, a couple things, three things to start is it must be one sentence. Don't give me a paragraph and a page and a sad story and all that. Boil it down to one sentence, which people find extremely difficult. It took me 90 days to get my sentence boiled down. Okay. It must be yours. You must fully own it. The only way to fully own your owner's intent is that you gotta you've got to carry it for a little while. Like you say, this is it, and I'm gonna carry it. Does it pass the test of like making decisions through that? And then your lens go through that. And then it must be pressure tested. So when the tough decisions come out or when the the hard things come through, how do you deal with those? And that will share your true owner's intent. So for me at Gravy, when I started was to build a company that I would want my adult children to work at one day if they so chose to. And so 
when it, you get into firing people, when you get into hard decisions, or we got to cut seven people in this thing, like all of these different things that are going to happen. And then it's like, how would I, like even the bad things, does it pass the pressure test? Did we treat them that way? How would I want my kids treated if they were adults working in this company? And so that's what mine would be. And so a couple of things to avoid is thinking you should have a particular intent. Avoid what others think you should do. Your boss, your spouse, your family, your pastor, whatever. Avoid what others think you can or can't do. Avoid what you think you can or can't do. I didn't know if I could build a company that my would, adult children would be proud to work at when I started. I didn't know if I could, yep. but you decide. And then the last one is, this one's very important. For genuinely good people, this one's very important. Avoid what sounds good or noble. So I was working with a, this entrepreneur and she kept saying, my intent with this company is to influence and empower 1 billion women for good. Okay. Zero people can argue with that, right? I mean, it's like, okay. But every time I talked to her, she was stressed about net profit. Like, so I got about six months into the relationship and she's like, yeah, but we want to do a billion and that's why we want to grow and all this kind of stuff. And I said, not one time have you ever been stressed about not hitting, influencing these women for good. Everything you've been stressed about has been what's the net profit of the company so you can live your lifestyle. And so maybe it would be okay to reconsider that you don't have to have this grandiose vision of this good thing you've got to do and just go, I want to live in San Diego, California in this specific building in high rise. And I want to make a million dollars EBITDA off my company every year. And then we got her to that. And she was like, I feel so relieved because she was unintentionally lying to herself, her team, her customers and everything. It doesn't mean that her heart wasn't in that. It just means that that wasn't the true motivating factor for why she had that business and how it imp impacted her personal life. And so getting down to being okay with whatever the hell it is, as long as you're truly happy with it, that's the end game and the answer. And so if somebody can achieve that and one person could achieve that by listening to this and be okay that they don't have to scale, to be okay, they don't have to get the pay raise, to be okay, they don't have to have more to be happy, to be okay with just, I have what I have. And this is what I do. And I just work here because it's good people. And my intent is to work with good people. Salary is not it. This isn't it. This isn't it. This is what it is. And the way you know what somebody's owner intent ultimately is, because here's the deal, whether you define it or not, it's always going to come out. And so the way you know what it is, is what stresses you out most. That's the truth of what you truly have an intent for with your business in your life. The way you know is what stresses you out most. Yes. Can you go a little bit a little bit deeper into that? Like, what does that mean? So if that example, she was stressed about the net profit all the time. Yep. So that tells me that's what she cares deeply and most about. There were no metrics to measure the billion people. Yep. There was no no stories of going, here's this lady. And if it was truly it a billion. Sounded people, good. It sounded, it sounded good, good, but it didn't do, it that, wasn't. That's it. right. So then you look at, so, so there's three types. There's three big buckets that usually drive people's owner's intent. It's income, independence, or influence. Yep. Income, independence, or influence. And you can only pick one of those to be your core driving factor. And independence means time freedom and the ability to choose who you work with and when you work with them, work on your own schedule. And so when people come to realization that really, I don't really care about being a unicorn company. I truly love making $5 million a year and throwing off $500,000. And I love playing golf with my friends. And damn, I'm happy and satisfied with that. That is somebody that's found their owner's intent. And that kind of person is the kind of person that creates health, not only in their company, but in their relationships, because they don't have this thing that's out there that they think they've got to do or they've got to be they've discovered inside of themselves what makes them fulfilled and happy. Awesome. I've got one more question for you. How often should someone revisit their owner's intent and revisit so, that? So, yeah, that's a great question. So people don't oftentimes pick an owner's intent because they're scared that they're stuck with it. But what I always say is you already have it. You just haven't discovered it. And so as life uh, morphs and changes, it's your life at any time. You can come back and say, I've based on the data, based on the facts, 
based on the circumstance, my wife got cancer, let's just say. Instantly, like you change your intent. I was trying to be a unicorn. All I care about now is having time freedom to be able to care for my wife. I'm changing my intent. The only rule with this is when it changes, you must let yourself know and the people around you know that it changed. Casey, this has been an awesome conversation. Thanks for joining me today. Where can people find out more about what you're working on? Where would you like to send folks? And yeah, we'll, include so- links. we'll include links to the book in the show notes. Where would you yeah. like to send people? So the website where you can get on my, I send an email once a week to leaders, just one email and where my LinkedIn is connected and my book is connected. The website is don'tfail.biz, don'tfail.biz. And it's got everything there. Awesome. If you know of someone who would enjoy this conversation, get value out of the conversation, please share it with them and let Casey and I know via LinkedIn. Sales is a thinking process. Business is a thinking process. Life is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about your process? 